Today we're going to be doing something just a little bit different, but if you have questions, throw the questions into the chat. I'll be happy to answer some of those as we go along. But I figured um, I would go in and share about curriculums today. I'm going to take you guys through a lesson. So we're going to talk about the lesson itself. We're going to look at what needs improvement, what does what it does really, really well. And I figured if this is something that people enjoy um, or appreciate having some knowledge of just being able to go through a core program itself, um, then we could continue doing it with other core programs like Wonders and Journeys and um, into reading. <laughs> There's a ton of them that are out there. So the possibilities are practically endless. Um, so I hope to try to be able to watch as people are coming in. But um, once again, if you have any questions, you can drop those into the chat as we go along. Um, but are you a familiar with CKLA? Have you done CKLA? Have you seen it, heard about it? Like what's your knowledge so far when it comes to um, that type of core program? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm gonna open a Diet Coke. <laughs> so please excuse me, I'll try to be quiet. Okay, so not very familiar with it. Um, I've heard about it. So let me give you a little bit of background knowledge um, when it comes to CKLA. And I will say, you're going to hear me refer to it as a core program. A lot of people, and this is something new that I've learned with the position that I have, because I would have been this person last year, but a lot of people refer to um, boxed curriculums as a curriculum, right? It is the curriculum. That's what we like live or die by. We like follow the curriculum, that's what we're doing, whatever is given to us in that box, that teacher manual's there. When in reality, it's not a curriculum, it's a core program. So I am sharing a little bit about the difference between a curriculum and a core program, and then we're gonna jump into looking at CKLA together. So I'm gonna just kind of hash it out and talking about what are some of the things we can enhance, and then what are some of the things that maybe the core program does really, really well, and that's benefits like a reading and writing teacher. So that's kind of the journey we're on today. Um, and maybe if this is something people like, we can start taking a look at different core programs and doing kind of the same thing with them in the future. I don't know, we're gonna try it out. So um, a curriculum itself, a core program itself is the boxed curriculum that it comes in. So again, a lot of people refer to it as a curriculum, but that's not your curriculum. And in fact, we need to have both. You have to have a core program, which would be your CKLA wonders into reading um, HMH. I'm, I can't think of all of them off the top of my hand, but those are the examples, right? And then you want to have a curriculum because what's happening is that these big companies are taking these like core programs that they're writing. They're looking for the state standards that match what they've created and they're throwing those in there and they're saying, look, it's like designed and outlined for your state when in reality, that's not really true. They're not going to rewrite 50 different curriculums. That's not a possibility. They have one core program that they've written and they're just kind of mixing and matching their state standards. So um, your curriculum that your district gives you basically says, hey, we're taking what the state has told us that we have to teach. We're looking at this core program that we've given you as a resource and we're pulling lessons to determine like what gaps do we need to fill inside of this core program? Like what is the core program doing? What is it not doing so that we can figure that out and fill it in? There is absolutely no program out there that's going to ever fit your needs, ever, ever. <laughs> and I really want to drive that home for people. Um, and the biggest aha moment for me too was, thank you, Monica, never ever. But um, one of the biggest aha moments, I was sat with a team. This was a, a fourth, fifth, sixth grade school. And the team included special ed director, uh, principal, curriculum director. Um, there were some teachers, there was a counselor, so on and so forth. So it was a, a 
good group. There was like 10 of them that were there. And this team was meant to discuss uh, where the data was telling them that they needed to focus on. So basically what they did is they took their Acadian's data and they were looking at it, analyzing it. And then they were saying, okay, well, our kids really need help when it comes to decoding. So that's where our focus needs to be as a team. We're going to talk about what we do in our classrooms for tier one. So this is for everybody. And then we're going to make some adjustments and see if this helps to increase our students scores within like this benchmark assessment that we're doing. And I'm sitting there and I'm just a facilitator. I'm, I'm listening. I'm taking all the information in. I'm like the outsider that just chimes in every once in a while to add some guidance. And one of the things that they started working on was an action plan. So they had analyzed it. They talked about what they were doing in their current curriculum to meet the needs for decoding in that grade level. And then they then had to decide, okay, well, what are some of the adjustments that we're going to make? Guys, they threw everything at it in the kitchen sink. They were like, oh, well, let's have our content teachers post the post the sounds up or the vocabulary words up and let's have um, our reading like every day we should do like something on the announcements and then we should do this. And they were throwing out all these ideas and they were typing them down and they had gotten to like the sixth or seventh one. And I finally was like, can I just stop you for just a second? I said, how are you planning to measure it? Like, how are you planning to decide, oh, this strategy is really working for our kids? How will you know what works and what doesn't work? And if you're doing everything and something is sticking, but you can't really identify what's sticking, are you going to continue to do all the things? Or is that just going to burn your teachers out? And it was something that really stopped everybody in their tracks. And I think it's important that when we look into these core programs, we have to remember that there are going to be pieces here that we need to enhance, that we have to add to it to make sure that the content's sticking. But we don't want to do all the things. We want to pick like one or two things that we can make sure that we're tracking and ensuring that it's working. Because if it doesn't work with our kids, we need to make adjustments as we start to go down the line. Hopefully, this makes a little bit of sense as we go through. Um, so our goal here is that we are looking at this core program and we're talking about where are we miss? What is not like hitting the mark here? What's missing? Where do we need to enhance it? What can we look at? And it's to meant to get your brain thinking that even if you don't have this core program or you don't have a core program at all, maybe it'll start to kind of get your brain thinking about what you're currently doing with some of your practices and how you can start to tweak it and make those small adjustments to increase your student outcomes at the end, because that's the, the overarching goal. So CKLA is a fairly recent-ish core program, I think. And you're going to hear me say curriculum because I'm still trying to learn. I'm teaching myself. I'm trying to erase a bad habit of saying curriculum. So I do apologize. Um, but it's a fairly new-ish one. The idea is, and they're, they're on to something. I'm not saying that they're not. <laughs> the idea is, is that we need to build content knowledge in our students. With science and social studies getting their, those blocks getting smaller and smaller and smaller, we're not giving kids a lot of opportunity to really dive in and learn content. And content knowledge is one of the key ingredients to comprehension. That content knowledge is your background knowledge. So when we have higher background knowledge, our comprehension is going to increase. So what CKLA does is that instead of focusing on the strategy itself, they focus more on the content. So I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to give you a little sneak peek of what this looks like. Um, if I can figure out how to share my screen. Oh, here's the button. Here's the button. Okay. Currently right now, the one that I'm looking at is fourth grade. It's the fourth grade um, 
Amplify CKLA. Ha, they even call it a curriculum. Um, but again, your curriculum is what your school district creates and they align the core program to the curriculum. They fill in the gaps. They do all the things. Okay. Um, so here you're going to see, let me actually back up one. Let me see if I can go here. So you can see we have fourth grade units. Um, unit one is personal narratives, which kudos to them for adding personal narratives in there. Unit two is empires in the middle ages. So we continue um, with part two there. We have poetry, geology, American Revolution. So you can see how every unit is more of a content focus. It's very, very heavy and informational. So you have all of your content focus pieces. So I think I went into this, this second unit here and I wanted to look at the lesson. So here you can see the Middle Ages, lords and serfs if I'm pronouncing that properly, knights and castles, towns in the Middle Ages, manors and towns, so on and so forth. So let me show you what that curriculum core program, I mean, that's core program looks like. So in this one, again, it's really focusing more so on the content rather than the strategies, whereas other core programs focus on those strategies pieces. So lesson one, this is how it's broken down. So they have core connections, which is 45 minutes of a teacher's time block, and then reading, which is another 45. So they account for their lessons to be an hour and a half, which is an interesting conversation as we start to get through these. Um, I always come back, so Monica says, I always come back to the same issue. How can they infer, compare, et cetera, if they don't have background knowledge? You are absolutely correct. And that's one of the biggest things is that comprehension, um, the re research, and I feel like such a, a noob. I don't know if that's the word, but I do. I feel so weird saying these things because I'm like, research, research. I have never been this person, <laughs> but now that I'm in this job and it's like, I, that's all I do is I look at research and look at all of the things. It just starts to become part of my daily language. So I apologize if it drives you nuts, but the research is out there saying that you need to have vocabulary, knowledge, an inference, which fun fact, um, there was a session that I had gone to with this. She was like a, a doctor at Middle Tennessee, I believe is where she was at. And she's like head of all of her doctorate program, yada, yada. And she said that in the 70s, was it 70s and 80s? I think I'm pretty sure it was the 80s. I don't know about the 70s part, but in the 80s, teachers didn't teach inference. Like there was nothing in their curriculums that told them to teach inference. Now they like naturally had those conversations, but it wasn't like explicitly taught. Isn't that fascinating? Um, okay. So lesson two goes into Lords and Serfs. And so this time it's broken up different, which is reading 45 minutes, language 30 minutes, and then writing 15 minutes. And then lesson three, you're going to see it's reading 45, writing 45, and then it breaks it down. I don't know how I feel about this. Now, they do incorporate some writing. So you can see in here that they're writing paragraphs. Like here, it's draft and informative paragraphs. So they're bringing in a, a written element, but every day it's something like very different. I don't know how I feel about it. I, I mean, granted, I, I never taught with this, so I, I wouldn't be able to tell you. Now, I do have a school that is using it, and their teachers really struggle. Now, the reason their teachers struggle is because they are inner city. It's an inner city charter school. Um, high population of students. It's more so of like the culture they don't get this. Like the culture and climate of that, the clientele of that school, they're like, I don't understand this. Like what is happening here? <laughs> and those kids don't care about knights and castles. Like it's not something that relates to them and they can't connect with it. Hopefully that makes sense. So they don't love it too much. Um, 
So what we're going to do is we're going to look at lesson two because this one is broken up a little bit more and I liked the fact that it had a written component. So I wanted to talk about what that looked like. So I'm going to scroll down, gives you an introduction. I do apologize. Let me see if I can go this way so I don't Lesson one and lesson two. Okay, lords and serfs. All right, so we start off by looking at the focus of the lesson. Now, I'm not going to lie. The focus of the lesson, these all sound really great, right? Like students are referring to details and examples when explaining relationships. So that's like asking and answering questions. It's anger one. Boom, we've got that, right? You've got grammar. So looking at the relationship and you can see like here are the common core anchors that you can refer to. Um, morphology, so you're looking at prefixes, un and non for root words. And then you have writing, which is using a graphic organizer to produce clear and coherent writing that contrasts the life. So right there, you have your anchor. Um, so the, the skill, the, the learning targets themselves sound great. The objectives that they have their students wanting to do, I'm, I'm, I like them. I mean, what do you guys think? Are you, those sound great to me as a teacher. I'm like, oh, this sounds like a really great lesson. <laughs> I would totally do that. Um, so for the formative assessment, you can see they have some activity pages and I did download the activity pages so that you guys can look at it. But as we start to go through, you have the lesson at the glance. Now, here's what I want you to kind of marinate and let me know your thoughts in the comments, okay? I wanna hear what you think. Reading 45 minutes. You're gonna read chapter two, whole class slash individual. Discuss the chapter and lesson wrap up. And then you're gonna do word work on rival, which is five minutes. including activity pages, okay? So you have an activity page that your students are working on. Language, that's grammar and morphology. So looking at nouns and adjectives, you have an activity page, and then you have a prefix poster with an activity page, okay? 30 minutes. 15 minutes, which is looking and taking notes with a graphic organizer. So the students have a graphic organizer and that's supposed to be 15 minutes. Renee says too much whole group missing differentiation. My kids would lose focus. Yeah. It's a, it seems like a lot in a very short amount of time. And so as we go through, you're going to be like, what? They want you to do what? <laughs> um, so let's, let's look at it. So here um, they have a big question that's up on the board. Um, they're going to learn about the lives of lords and serfs during the Middle Ages. Okay. I can't, Monica says, I can't picture my current students now being, um, now being able to follow such a plan. I completely agree. And I think that's one of the challenges that the school right now that is, that has adopted CKLA this year is really struggling with. Um, but they're also following it, which is where, going back to what I said earlier, having this as a core program and then having a curriculum that both align together is important, okay? Because as a teacher, I, I don't think I would do all of this the way it is. Now, there are some pieces that are great, but that's the whole purpose of a core program. There's going to be pieces and elements that are going to work really well for your kids, but then there are things that you're going to have to adapt, which is fine. Um, they have the feudal system hierarchy that's posted, and then they're going to do a four corners activity for a check to understanding. So, um, interesting checks for understanding is something that I have started to become more and more familiar with And it's to make it like in the most simplest terms. It's like, um, um, who's, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a question off the top of my head. Um, true or false? Johnny ran into the park. And so it's true or false. 
check for understanding would be quickly getting a gauge of, do my kids know the content that we just read, right? So doing that, that is something as simple as doing a check for understanding. It's like simple engagement activities that they're doing, but it's being very intentional with the questions that you're asking to ensure that it's aligning to the objectives that you're making. So they have a four corners activity. I love four corners. I'm all about it. Okay. So language. Um, so language, I think, was going into 30 minutes, right? So language, they're going to have a noun and adjectives poster activity. They're going to do a prefix poster activity. And then they're going to write the following sentences on the board and probably have a discussion about it. Okay. 15 minutes, they're going to have a graphic organizer that they're completing for writing. So this is what the graphic organizer looks like for writing. Okay, this is fourth grade. Let me mind, let me remind you. Um, and then prepare visuals, yada, yada. Sounds good. So we have some academic vocabulary. We have lord, lady, privileged, rival, loyal, scythe. Sounds like some pretty good like tier two words. Love it. Okay. So as we start to go through, you have your vocabulary uh, monitoring for that. So we did some tier three words, some tier two words. Um, you have multiple meaning words, which it's interesting. Would you have put Lord like in multiple meaning words? I feel like I would have put Lord in multiple meaning words. I don't know. I feel like I would. Um, so reading. For lesson two, reminder, it's 45 minutes. A little way too much. I would love to be a fly on the wall in the classroom. Yeah, the kids get really stressed out. The teachers are very stressed out. So we have this 30 minute activity, but it says 40 minutes up here. So I guess the, the lesson itself is 30 minutes. So um, you're gonna read chapter two to the manor born. And then students are going to turn to the table of contents, locate the chapter, and then turn to the first page. Okay, they're using text features. I like that. That's nice, right? Um, you're going to preview core vocabulary. And then you're going to begin by telling students the first vocabulary word that they're going to encounter is in the chapter is the word Lord. So here is where it gets interesting. It says, have them find the word on page 10 to the reader. Explain that each vocabulary word is bolded the first time it appears in the chapter. Have students refer to the glossary at the back of the reader and locate Lord and then have a student read the definition. Explain the following part of speech, alternate forms of the word, and then have students go to the reference page. So here's your student's reference page. That's the reference page. So one of the things that we're learning a lot when it comes to vocabulary is the methods in which we present words to our students and how they start to really take in those words and really um, basically let it marinate, right? Like they, they capture those words, they start to utilize those words in conversations. But this, looking at something in a dictionary, is not effective teaching. So with vocabulary, um, looking at um, semantic maps, am I saying that right? I think I am. So going into synonyms, antonyms, giving examples, non-examples, like all of those are really good practices of how to embed vocabulary instruction. But looking at a definition is not going to benefit students. Now, could you have just like quickly given them a definition, given them a couple examples rather than read the dictionary? Yes. Now, do we need them to be able to go into a dictionary and look at it? Yes, I do agree with that. I mean, I look up words all the time to be able to tell me what they mean and then use them. But in order for us to develop connections, because I'm not going to remember that word that I just had my Kindle pop up the glossary. That's not the point. My point is that I want students to remember words. And in order to remember words, we need to develop connections. And so that's where the mapping comes into place. That's where the pictures of like examples, non-examples come into place because I can create connections to that word, which then increases my chances of using that word later on. So that's their, that's their chart. So they're given the definitions to these, and then they're going to have a student read the big question. 
How were the lives of serfs and lords different from each other? Love that question. It's a great question. I would have my students do like a TDA on that. Super great. I love it. And so then they have to read it. So this is the text that they're reading. They're reading chapter two. So this is what their text looks like. And then they start to go into, before reading this chapter, remind students that there are many strategies that they can define. And then they're going to read page 10 silently. Okay, I'm going to stop us presenting for just a minute. So let's talk about what we've seen so far. One, we've seen that they have had the students so far in this lesson basically look at these vocabulary terms and look them up in a dictionary. That's all they've done so far, which again is not really good instruction when it comes to vocabulary words. You can very easily, example, non-example for a vocabulary term to really help develop a connection to it. Super simple to do that. And then you can have students do activities later on if you wanted to. What's really important is that you wanna make sure that the words that they're picking, which they do here, the words that you're picking and you're discussing prior to a text are words that are going to impact their comprehension, okay? So let me repeat that again. The words that you're selecting to have conversations about prior to reading a text need to be words that are going to interfere with comprehension. So because they really do need to know what a Lord is in this sense, that was a really good term to have a conversation about because that's gonna impact their comprehension as they start to read it. The way that they did it, don't agree with so much because it's not explicit enough for those students. So that's one thing that I would change. I would have something super simple, examples, non-examples. The other thing that they're doing here is that they're having them read this silently. Now, I don't have any problem with kids reading things silently. Um, I will say that these texts are very challenging because you're talking about something that the kids cannot create connections with. And so there's no relatability to it. And so it's, it's, it's hard for them to get. But one of the other pieces that we're starting to find is that engagement with a text is really important to ensuring student outcomes. So there was a study that was recently put out. I think it was recent, but there were, we had this conversation about this study today. So there was a study that was done and the study says, um, they looked at schools who were utilizing strategies. So they were very strategy focused versus a school that did not utilize like comprehension strategies. There was no difference in their student outcomes. Meaning that the school that focused on comprehension strategies compared to the school that did not have comprehension strategies in their lessons, those kids performed the same. It's wild. Now, I would want to know more about like the study itself, like how many participants were inside of that study, like what was the length of time that you were doing, like demographics, like I would want to know all of that stuff because that plays a really big role in how valid that research study is. But it is very, very interesting. And it is something that I think we need to really consider where research is showing that our kids are performing the best is when they are engaged with the text. And when I mean engaged with the text, it's that they're talking about it, they're using it, and they are, um, there was one other. So they're talking about it, they're using it, and they're something. I can't remember it, and I apologize. <laughs> It'll come to me like later on when I'm sleeping. But the two are like the most important ones. Um, but when they're having those conversations about what is happening in the text, they're engaging with it. That is when we start to see our kids' comprehension outcomes increase. So in this case, what's happening here is that they're reading this silently, right? They're not really having conversations about it. And this is where like those really good teacher strategies that we use, like the partner talk, the choral readings, like all of those are really important as you start to have like talk about the text. Now, do they add questions in here? Yes, they do. And I'm going to show you what those questions look like. Um, yes, conversations and debate. Oral languages is beginning to make 
which is sad because oral language should have had made been more prominent in education always but i think it's becoming even more and more prominent on the importance of oral language skills in all grades not just your primary grades but all grades so here they have them read it silently and then they have questions what are some of the things privileged boys and girls learn to do now i want you to think in most classes, how would this go down? In most classes, when they had these questions, how would it happen? They've just read this page all by themselves, right? And now as a teacher, because I have 30 minutes, whew, that's very short, I got lot, lots to read, right? One, I haven't made sure that the kids, that all kids in my classroom have had access to this, okay? One of the biggest things to really remember is that tier one, which is your like, it's the thing that we are all doing. It's the first line of defense when it comes to instruction. Your tier one instruction, your whole group lesson needs to be given access to all students. Well, if I have like five or six kids that I know for a fact that cannot read that passage, what have they been doing for the last 10 minutes? Like what has been happening since they've been reading this page over there? How is that benefiting them? How is that providing them access with this content? It's not. But if I pulled in shared reading, if I did like, Echo, um, echo reading, choral reading, If you, even if you wanted to do some popcorn reading, if you wanted to throw that in there, my favorite is closed reading. Like those are methods for engaging with the text and it's giving all students access to it no matter where they are in their learning. That is a good tier one instruction, okay? So here, what most teachers would do is they would ask the question, kids would raise their hand, and then they would respond, right? Because again, ain't nobody got time. We got move. We got 30 minutes. I got a lot to get done here. But again, that's not having all of your students engaged with the text. So one of the things that you could easily do is pull in some other types of responses. So if they have the text in front of them, maybe they're putting their finger on something. Maybe they're turning knee to knee to tell the partner next to them something. This is really hard to do as like a choral response because it's too big and too broad. So choral would be that I asked a question that everybody, I know everybody's gonna have the exact same answer for and they would immediately give me that answer together in unison. This I wouldn't be able to do that with. Okay, so now they're gonna read page 11 silently. <laughs> And now we have another question. This time it's inferential. So what is another name for a castle? How does this, um, along with the information that you've read on page 10, help explain the meaning of the title of this chapter? What I find is really interesting is that there's no teacher think aloud happening. This is them reading and then me expecting them to have the answer. Like, what happens when they don't have the answer, CKLA? Like, where is the teacher model? Where is the, the thinking or the scaffolding in their learning here? Because none of that is shown into this lesson. And so when teachers don't have those tools in their toolbox, they're not going to use them. And so because they're saying, hey, I have to use this curriculum like by the book, they're doing exactly that. That's not explicit instruction. And students have to have explicit systematic instruction in order to help support them. So again, we have another question, asking it, they give you the answer. Okay, moving on. Reading page 12 to the end of the top sentence of page 13, okay? So reading it silently yet again, and then we're asking another question. Okay. Same thing, page 13 silently, and then I'm gonna ask a question. There's no form of scaffolding that's happening from the teacher. More questions, read page 14 and 15 silently, more questions, 
and then you're going to have them read this piece. So here, now, all of a sudden, now we have pairs and small groups, okay? So if time permits, which is very sad, have students conduct research independently in pairs and small groups to learn the answers of these questions. So these three questions, okay? So they would research it, they would do this. There's no time for that. How long would it take your students to read these pages? I'm going to be honest, like my fourth graders, it would take them 45 minutes. 45 minutes. Monica, that's fantastic. So she says, I have my kiddos listen to the text the first time for enjoyment first. Tying it with a working snack makes reading the text much more cozy and fun. Then we listen to it again and then annotate the text. Then again, or by parts again for specific purposes. This program seems awful. But you know what? It's the reality of a lot of core programs, to be honest, because this is what you're going to get. Um, what you're doing is perfect. What you're doing is you're giving purpose and you're allowing kids to figure out what is happening in the text before they start to take any form of a strategy and like start critically thinking and all the things. Because again, if they don't know what's happening in the text, they're not going to be able to do the strategies. If you want them to look at main idea and key details, well, if I have zero comprehension of what's going on in this text when I'm reading it, I'm not going to be able to do main idea and key details. That's not a possibility. So we have to build the first in order to get to the next one. So as we go through, let me kind of go back to my spot here. So now we are in this spot. So use the following questions to discuss the chapter. So we have more questions, more questions, more questions more this is a think pair share which is nice and then you could do a check for understanding with a uh pointing to the signs which are your four corners so it's not even getting them up and moving <laughs> bless these babies hearts okay from here you're going to have students take home activity 2.7 so this is activity 2.7 let me show you what that one 2.7 here's 2.7 Okay, and then they're going to have these pictures here. So these two pages are 2.7. So it says, take home the activity from 2.7 um, to read and complete for homework. Okay, so now we're getting into word work. Now we're getting into the word rival. So here, they actually do a semi-okay job introducing this vocabulary word. So you're going to have um, in the chapter, it says, we read this. Say the word rival with me. Everybody say it. Rival. Okay. Rival means competing. The baseball players won their game against a rival team. Great example. Love it. Like, I think that's a great example. Have, your, have you ever had a uh, had to face a rival team, classmate or peer? Okay. Trying to make that connection to them. Ask two or three students to use the target word in a sentence. So now they're putting it into a sentence. Here's where I probably would take this part out because I think it's a little bit too soon. I would give more opportunities for examples and non-examples, and I would give more opportunities for kids to, um, to practice with whether or not the word is being utilized correctly. And so lots and lots of examples when it comes to vocabulary words is important. You have adjective, like the part of speech, synonyms, antonyms. What does it mean? It does a semi-okay job. I would have put it at the beginning of the lesson, though, not at the end. That would have been just me. So here, now we're getting into language. So we have 30 minutes. Remember, that was supposed to be like 30 or 45 minutes. You're going to introduce nouns and ad adjectives, referring to the poster. Um... And just kind of, I'm going to backtrack just a little bit. So backtracking, we talked about how we would have changed that vocabulary word in the beginning. The vocabulary in the word, I would have moved it up, offering more examples for students. And then more active student engagement with the text itself, rather than them just going through 
I know it was another long text, but rather than them just going through and answering questions individually, like getting kids to actively engage and having those conversations with kids um, where they could talk with their peers, they could do some different types of in just something that's a little bit more engaging than just me saying, read this page silently. Now you're going to go do this. Read this page silently. Now you're going to go do this. It's not effective. Um, so here in the language portion, we're looking at parts of speech. You're grouping them. You're going to refer to a poster, a poster. That's how they're going to learn. And then ask students to make a list on the on the border chart part of the nouns um, that they can see in the room. I like the connection there. I don't think that that's bad. So the proper nouns begin with capital letters, whereas common nouns, blah, blah, blah. We've got that. That tells good. So tell students that nouns can be placed into two categories, so common and proper. Okay, I like that. That's not bad. Then we start to go into some adjectives. And then quickly, they will have a worksheet that they end up completing. So inside of their worksheet here, uh, here's their nouns and adjectives. Okay, three nouns, one adjective. So it'll show it to them, which I really appreciate this. I think this is a great scaffold for students. I wouldn't necessarily use it for all of my students. So um, if you wanted to like put some white out on something like this, put some white out on it because not all of your students are going to need that. And you want to be able to challenge them enough, especially if you've had conversations about nouns and adjectives, which these kids are fourth graders. We should have had those conversations already. Taking that scaffold away and then seeing what they can do. And then for my students who need that scaffold, I would keep it in place. One of the things that we are finding is that teachers love scaffolds but then we never remove them. And so it's important to remember, hey, I need to take this scaffold away sooner or later. I can't keep just giving this piece to you. I need to allow you to have kind of that friction, that challenge in order for your brain to be able to um, move and adjust and grow, right? We need the struggle in order for them to be able to learn. So hopefully that helps. <laughs> So they're going to write a few sentences on the board. They're going to do some um, work with identifying those noun and adjectives. I would have like had a, a sentence on the board and given my kids some whiteboards, right? Or if I knew for a fact that there was only one noun and one adjective, you know, have them chorally respond. So I would read the sentence uh, fluidly. Maybe we would chorally read that sentence together. And then I would say, uh, the noun is, what is it? So uh, for choral responses, I have these little, this little dog clicker. And so because I can't always snap really loud. And so I will say uh, the noun of the text or the noun in the sentence is, wait for my click. And as soon as it clicks, everybody chorally responds. And what that does, it's like Pavlov dog <laughs> kind of situation. But, um, but what it does is that it, brings everybody together, it gives them think time, and then it encourages everybody to say it together versus always having the one that's the blurter, and then they say it first, and then everybody just kind of follows. This is kind of leveling the playing field, saying we're all going to respond at the exact same time. So these are great for choral responses, because then you can click and then have them respond. Um, this is actually a something that I got off of the autism side of the initiatives that I work for because they use a lot of BF Skinner, so the ABA inside of their classrooms. Um, and so it's a, it's a big behavior analysis. And this is one of the things that they have found is that getting them to respond on a signal is important. So pretty interesting. You can dive into BF Skinner and all of that really interesting stuff that we forgot from our first year of college. <laughs> but now it's back. So I would have had some whiteboard practice, giving them opportunities to write, to circle it, do something that was a little bit more engaging than just having them, you know, one person recite it at one time. Morphology isn't any different, to be honest. They have kind of a poster in here. They're going to remind them what un or non is. They're going to look through some of these practice words, and then they have another worksheet that they're going to do. Um, so students are going to provide sentences using the word unfamiliar, 
ask students for synonyms, write essential on the board, briefly discuss the word, and then use it in a sentence, add non to essential, and have students reread the new word, discuss the meaning of the new word, also point out the prefix non does not change, and then share some more examples. Again, there's not a lot of student engagement that's happening here. It's coming so much from the teacher. The teacher is the one that's doing all of the work. In order for the kids to learn, they got to do the work. So this is where instead of doing it this way, I would have provided them with, you know, maybe a sort or something to be able to do and kind of going back and having a conversation about that after I've presented what the meaning of these prefixes are. They would have gone back to their groups. They would have done a sort. Maybe they would have had some conversations and then they would have shared out. That to me is an active engagement routine instead of them just sitting in their desks and doing it. So they give you that. You have another activity that goes with it. Here's the last part, which is writing. Um, and so their writing part, if we go back to their focus, it's to utilize a graphic organizer to produce clear and coherent writing, which is great. Graphic organizers are wonderful. The research shows that graphic organizers really help to increase student outcomes in both reading and writing. Oh yeah, we're gonna use them because we know that they work. We just can't overuse them, okay? We have to make sure that if we're doing plot, the plot graphic organizer stays the same. If we're comparing and contrasting, that comparing and contrasting stays the same. We don't want to constantly change up our graphic organizers because that's when we start to have um, confusion when it comes to how we use them. So in this one, they're going to take chapter two, and then it says, in this short writing lesson, you're going to model how to take notes on a text using a graphic organizer. Guys, it's 15 minutes. They already said it was short. Like, how are you going to have enough time to do this? <laughs> so take time at the beginning. And then it does say, if necessary, take time at the beginning of the next writing lesson to finish in completing this column. That's good and great. But it's like, if I take time from that lesson and then I'm going to have to move it to the next lesson like it, it's like a domino effect like when am I supposed to catch up here so um they take them through and they have kids completing this graphic organizer so here's the direct quote the suggested paraphrase that they give you which is wonderful but it's never explicitly taught. And there is no way that you can explicitly teach this in 15 minutes while also providing your kids the opportunity to be able to go back and complete it. And what I also find fascinating is that what they are gathering from the text, what they're taking from the text, they were never using those questions. The questions that they were asking never relate to this. There is no correlation between them. The core, they're two totally separate pieces. Now, I may have been able to get this done in 15 minutes if all of the questions, the conversations that I was having while we were reading that text pertain to us looking at homes, work, clothing, food, power, like all of that. If I was asking those right questions, maybe my students would have been able to finish this because I would have already primed them. I would have already got them thinking and looking for where that information is in the text. But now I want them looking for something totally different that they haven't looked for yet in that text. Let's not forget how many pages that was. Talk about overwhelm. And so the writing here. I'm just saying it is terrible. It is horrible. It is an injustice to kids. It is not going to help them. It is not explicit. And it is very, very sad that they could not make the connection between the two to help prime and encourage and make sure that kids were successful when they were to go back to their seats to start doing this. That's my thoughts. And then it wraps it up. And then, of course, they have their homework that they're taking home for that day. But that is one day's worth of lessons. One day. So what do you guys think? Thoughts on any of that? What are your thoughts on 
the suggestions that I've offered? Um, are there is there anything that you feel as though, oh, I can take that away and maybe start to apply some of that into my own practices that I'm doing in my classroom? Hopefully it was helpful. Um, even when I'm model writing, if they don't have prior no knowledge, it's so challenging. Yes, absolutely, Monica. It is very challenging. And that was one of the really big philosophies in what Bridging Literacy was founded on, was building that deep connection between reading and writing and understanding that we have to build the reading component in order for them to be successful in that writing piece. But when we don't create those connections for them, when we don't give them those opportunities to have some of those aha moments, it's such a struggle. Like you could easily tweak those questions ever so slightly to help them be able to feel successful in that writing piece. So that is another big change that I would do to that. Definitely would have that. I mean, hopefully this was something that you found interesting. Um, let me know if this is something that you would like to. And even if you are looking at this from a recording aspect and you're like watching it afterwards, let me know if you want me to look and dive deep into another core program and dig into what are some of the things we could do differently with these core programs. Because again, they're not perfect. <laughs> There's nothing nothing out there that is going to be absolutely perfect for all of your students. And so it's important that when we're looking at these, we're really looking at them critically and thinking about the adjustments that we need to make in order to ensure that we're giving our students really strong tier one instruction. So a uh, comment, I like hearing your thoughts on the active engagement with text, talking and using the text. I will be thinking about how to add more of that in the shared read portion of the core program that I have to use. Yeah, absolutely. I do have a video that's going to come out this Sunday, and that's going to be one of the things that I'm talking about. So I'll share a little bit more explicitly on YouTube um, those strategies so that you can take that back. Um, but I'll be, it's going to be a little bit more visual for you. So hopefully it'll help. <laughs> And then we'll add to those as we go along. Um, but thank you. I mean, thank you so much for coming and joining me. If you have any questions here, uh, please let me know. I'm going to stay. go ahead and stop the recording. And then that way, if you have some questions on the live chat, you can ask those questions. And if not, you're welcome to, to head out. So I'll stop the recording now.